Hi, my name is Hope Blitz. I am a fourth year graduate student in the Myler Lab, and I'm going to talk about comparative modeling with Rosetta. So why do comparative modeling? Um, in the previous lecture, you guys heard about ab initio protein folding, where you start with the sequence um, and produce a final structure. But this shows best results for proteins with less than 120 amino acids. And oftentimes, we want to model proteins that are quite larger than that. Um, and you can actually use um, or gain structural information from crystal structures of related proteins. So this, you can actually use this to limit your search space for your um, protein of interest that you want to model. So if you have a sequence and you want to create a homology model, what you need are template PDBs of related structures. So there's a few different ways that you could go about doing this. One, you could do simple, single template modeling. Um, <clears throat> so you would use uh, the sequence and the structure, uh, fragments from the structure of a related protein. And typically, you would want to use single template modeling when you have high sequence identity with your between your target and your template, so greater than 60% sequence identity. You can use multiple template modeling where you actually have multiple um, structures that you're using as templates. So this would combine um, fragments from all of those models into your final model. And you can use this when you have um, templates available that are around 30 or 50 percent sequence identity. And just a note, I've been using the um, phrase comparative modeling, but this is the same as homology modeling. So in Rosetta, typically the language is used for as comparative modeling, but um, there's not really a difference. We're just emphasizing that your template pr uh, proteins don't necessarily have to be homologs of your target protein. So the general workflow for Rosetta CM is identifying the template sequences you want to use, uh, preparing the sequence alignments, threading those, uh, using those alignments to thread um, your target sequence onto your template, running hybridize, relaxing those structures, and then scoring and selecting your final models. And in this tutorial, we will use the dopamine D3 receptor. So first, you need to get a FASFA of your target sequence. In this case, you can go to NCBI um, and search in the protein database for your um, target protein and get the FASFA for this. If you already have the FASFA for your target uh, protein, then you wouldn't need this. You wouldn't need to do this step. So the next is identifying your templates that you want to use. So in this case, um, we're modeling the dopamine D3 receptor. This is a class A G protein coupled receptors. Uh, and for those of you familiar with uh, GPCRs, then you know there are different classes. And within those classes, um, for example, class A, there are different families of those receptors as well. <clears throat> and you can use this information to uh, help you decide on templates you want to use. Also, what's known about GPCRs is that they have tr seven transmembrane helices, um, three extracellular and three intracellular loops. And there's also highly conserved residues across the entire family, and especially across um, the class A receptors. So this is just an example of some background information that we have going into our modeling. And if there's a way you can use that background information, then you want to. And so we'll talk about how we use that information later on. So you want to identify um, some sequences to use. And you can use um, BLAST for this. And when you're running BLAST for your sequence, you want to search uh, use the PDB as a search database because you're looking for um, similar sequences that have a structure, a determined structure. And typically you want um, templates that have greater than 30% uh, sequence identity. 
<clears throat> and in this case, that is possible for us. You could also use fold recognition to choose templates. So if you used um, some software to predict secondary structure information and then detect proteins with um, similar 3D characteristics. So here's a list of some of the possible templates we could use for modeling dopamine D3. And you can see that we don't have any um, templates that are of really high sequence identity. So um, we don't have 60% or even 50 greater than 50% sequence identity. So in this case, we want to choose multiple templates. Um, we've had previous studies have been done that look at if you want um, to use kind of how many templates you would want to use. So, And they found that there's kind of this Goldilocks effect where if you have too few templates, um, there's not quite enough information. If you have too many, uh, that can also kind of confuse Rosetta in a way. Um, so you, they found that you typically want to use around five templates if you have that many. So these are the five uh, templates we're going to use for this modeling exercise. And you'll need to go to the PDB and download those structures. Once you have those structures downloaded and your templates chosen, then you'll want to make uh, sequence alignments. We're going to use Cluster Omega in this case. Uh, you could use a different software if you wanted to make your sequence alignments. But uh, that's what we're going to use here. And once you get your sequence alignment, you'll want to download that. But I highly recommend looking at your sequence alignment um, actually by hand. So maybe you don't necessarily need to create your entire alignment by yourself, but once you get an alignment, you may want to adjust that. So like I said before, um, there's a lot known about GPCRs and that they have highly conserved residues in some areas. Um, you can use prediction, secondary structure predictions to look at your alignments to see if there's something you want to adjust, um, or even membrane spanning regions in this case. So you can see here at the beginning we know that the uh, areas colored in light green are helical regions, and those don't quite line up in the raw alignment, and we can adjust that to where they line up better. So this is just an example of if you do not um, adjust your sequence alignment of what could happen. So in this, uh, on the in the red structure, this was just using a raw alignment, and you can tell that this uh, region that probably should be structured is very unstructured. However, in the adjusted alignment, you have this nice helical, um, this nice helix. So these alignments, while they're fairly simple, they can have a big impact on your modeling. Once you have your alignments, then you'll want to th do the threading. So that's a separate application, Rosetta, where you feed it the alignments um, and your template PDBs. And essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like, like if the sequence um, was on a piece of thread and you're just threading it over the backbone of your template. So this is kind of an example of what that looks like. So you can see for our target sequence, we have this leucine first, and it's aligned to another leucine, so it gets the coordinates from that. Um, then you have a lysine, and that's aligned with this other leucine, which have the coordinates 1, 1, 1, so that lysine will get that coordinate. Um, then we have a little bit of a gap, and then the next is a histidine, and you can um, see where that's aligned to, and that will get the corresponding coordinates. Then if you have a residue that's not aligned, it will not get those coordinates. So the partial thread only accepts alignments in aggression format. Um, so the Clustal uh, format will give you all the sequences in one file. And in the aggression format, you have one, one file per alignment pair. Um, and the sequences are continuous over one line for each sequence. Um, we actually have a script that will convert the multiple sequence alignment um, from Clustal to the Grishin format, and we also have the alignment files in your demo uh, folder provided for you. 
So the hybridized protocol contains um, three main stages. <clears throat> you will generate initial models from the templates, and then you'll kind of explore deviations from those templates. Um, and they'll also be like we showed those gaps in where you don't have a template maybe for a certain um, part of your sequence of your target. So in that case, uh, Rosetta actually uses more of the de novo uh, protocol where you're taking those small fragments, so those three mers and nine mers, and um, aligning those fragments with the sequence. So that's one way that it will do the sampling. Um, and it will also sample from the different templates. Then you do a Cartesian um, minimization to make sure all of those uh, loops are closed. And then a full atom backbone and sidechain refinement. And then a final relax. So your final models should contain um, information from your multiple templates. So you'll have chunks of your templates in your final model. So here you can see that the um, green colored region came from the PDB4DJH and this blue region in the back came from 4EA3. Um, so this is kind of how you would imagine you take these different fragments um, from all your templates and combine them into the highest or the best scoring. So your bare minimum input files for Rosetta CM are your partially threaded structures and the mover definition and your options. So that's going to be like your XML script and then your options for running. And that's pretty typical of almost any protocol that you're running in CM. So for membrane protein specifically, you'll also need some other files. Um, this includes the span file, which defines the spanning regions, which we'll talk about shortly, and the membrane weight patches. Um, some other files that you might want to include are information about your constraints that you may have. So let's say you have a collaborator who's working on this structure, or maybe you yourself work on this structure, um, work on this protein, and you know from different experiments that certain residues are going to be close to each other, and you can include that information um, up front. If there are disulfide bonds in your protein, you'll also want to include that information. So the membrane spanning regions, um, you can use a, a predictive web server called Octopus um, to get these membrane spanning regions. So essentially, you go to this website, you input the fastest sequence, and it gives you this topology prediction. And <clears throat> sorry, Octopus, along with other uh, membrane spanning prediction tools, use the entire sequence to make these predictions. And in our case, we haven't talked about this so much, but we will be altering the sequence a little bit to make um, one of the loops smaller and truncating the NNC terminus. Um, but this might, those regions that we're deleting might contain important information for Octopus in its prediction. So what we're actually going to do is put in the full sequence before we alter it. Um, get the topology file prediction, convert that to a span file. Um, we have a provided script for that. And then convert that span file just to make sure the residues line up. So we'll have to change some of the residue numbering in the span file so it matches your target sequence. Um, for example, if we input the altered sequence that we have for the dopamine D3 receptor, Octopus will actually predict six transmute transmembrane spanning regions, um, but we know since this is a GPCR that it should have seven transmembrane helices. Um, so that's an example of how you're going to use background knowledge that you have of your protein that you, you want to model um, to make sure you're modeling this as accurately as possible. And the spin file just helps Rosetta place the membrane for your protein, so you define those transmembrane regions and then it's able to place the membrane and know the orientation that your protein should be in the membrane. So that um, placement of the membrane will change how the membrane weights, uh, how the membrane score terms are scoring those residues. So if, if you don't include membrane penalties or these weights, then you could get kind of uh, weird structures that would not be actually favorable 
For example, you have this large loop sampling down into the membrane when you know that that wouldn't um, be favorable if you were taking into account the hydrophobic environment that's actually there. So the disulfide um, file is fairly simple. You just include the residue numbers that you want um, to be bonded. So in this case, 72 and 150. And this is an example of what part of your XML script will look like. So here you define your different score functions that you'll be using. So you have um, different, score, different score functions for the uh, various stages of CM. And in this case, like I said, we're using actually um, the membrane weights because we are using a membrane protein. You can also, within your XML script, uh, re-weight certain terms. So like for the last score function, you see that it's named membrane. We're using the full atom membrane um, score function, but we want to make sure that we re-weight CART bonded so that we give it a weight because we're going to be doing relax in Cartesian space. So this is important in uh, making that relax work. This is where hybridize is defined in your XML script, um, where you set the different parameters that you want. You also define your threaded PDBs. Um, and you're also defining fast relax here. So that's a separate mover, but you'll also want to run it. And you also define your weights here. If all of your weights are the same, um, something will be, your, a template will be chosen um, based on the highest sequence alignment um, or the best sequence alignment. But if you want to always start out with the same uh, template PDB, then you need to up your weight. Make your weight higher for that one than for the others. Here's a list of your Rosetta CM options. Uh, you can see that you uh, supply the FASA file. You want to make sure that you're pointing to your XML script. Um, and different, you have different options for relax. So you'll want to be sure to include that. And this is, um, I just want to emphasize here at the end that what I've talked you through is a very um, traditional way of using Rosetta CM. You have a sequence, um, you want to get a model of that, so you get the sequence and the templates and you produce this, um, this model. But you should also, um, I encourage you to think of ways that you could use Rosetta CM to answer other types of questions um, or look at your modeling in kind of a different perspective. So this is just an example from Brian Bender, who's a graduate student in the lab. Um, he's now a postdoc. And he actually used this um, iteratively to build up his extracellular side of a receptor. So he knew he had a peptide um, that was binding in the pocket of this GPCR. So he started, he built up the core um, of the receptor, started with a fragment of that peptide, then built up the loops further, built up the peptide further, further built up the loops, then the whole peptide, and then the final loops. So in this case, he was able to model this without the binding pocket collapsing on him. So in this tutorial, um, you're going to have four steps. You'll have the setup step, threading, uh, you'll actually run hybridize, and then your final model selection. And uh, Information or documentation can be found on the Rosetta Commons website, or if you want to read more about this algorithm, there's a paper. Uh, you can read this paper, and it will discuss in more detail about what's happening. Thank you.